Hey everyone, welcome back to The Health Bridge. This is Dr. Pedram Shojai here with Dr. Sarah Gottfried. Hi everyone. Hey, hey Sarah. Um, we are uh, having some fun this season. Uh, we're, in our, we're in full swing for our new season here. We're about to start our gongs and uh, share with you guys uh, some of the stuff that, that we're doing. Uh, and there's been a lot of things that I've had to kind of shake up in my life having had a new human being show up in it. And uh, one of those is looking at all the products and the crazy stuff that, that comes into the house and how that impacts the health of our child. So. I had the distinct uh, pleasure of meeting our guest um, at the uh, the Expo West, the, the trade show that has all of the, it's kind of like the circus of you know what's happening in the health and wellness space. And I really, really uh, appreciate what uh, she had to say and offer. So we're happy to have Kim Walls on the Health Bridge today. Hi, Kim. Hi. Thank you so much. The distinct pleasure is mutual. And Sarah, great to meet you too. Great to meet you, Kim. I'm so excited to dive into this material. Yeah, so just, just to kind of preface it, and I'll let you kind of uh, tell your story a little bit, but you know, Kim comes from a, a history of having been in the, the space of, you know, like with Epicurean through the family and all that, and, and really understanding what goes on to the body and through the skin gets absorbed. And she really took that to the next level for our children. So she did a lot of her homework and really figured out what it is that can be healthy for the, the skin to skin contact of the microbiome and like that uh, the the touch time between mommy and baby and how that transference of good bacteria happens and how we don't uh, intercept that with uh, some of the products that would get in the way of, of the healthy stuff that, that should be happening between mom and child. So I'd love for you to kind of just jump in quickly about how you got into this and and what you're doing and then we're just going to kind of poke around and, and kind of tap your, your your genius brain on this. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> where to start? I mean, you did a great summary right there, really. I mean, when it comes to Epicurean, we were working in the professional world. We were some of the first to bring skincare into the medical community and really developed through that process a deep understanding of the function of skin as the largest organ of body, largest organ of the body, and how it's tied into immunity and can ultimately support our entire immune system. And the skincare products that were out there for babies and kids, mine are now eight and 11. So I went shopping for them and was aghast at what was out there. It was really, everybody was treating skin like a cellophane wrapper, not recognizing the activity that's happening throughout the whole body and the interconnectedness of that organ with every other critical organ that we have. So in looking at that and evaluating that process, I wanted to create something for babies that would function to help increase overall health. So yes, we focus on dryness and dehydration and eczema and the various skin problems, sun care, uh, but the choices of ingredients, the actively healthy ingredients, go far beyond your basic treatment like a cellophane wrapper. That's huge because most people don't realize, and we talked about this before with like, you know, just taking showers with chlorine, how much of the stuff mm -hmm. absorbs through your skin and what that actually means for your body, what that means for the balance um, of your your health, and I, and I had this uh, back in the clinic. We, we brought in uh, hand sanitizers because someone said that's a good idea. And then all of a sudden I was getting these weird kind of patches on my skin and, and getting kind of like this, this weird kind of fungal overgrowth. I'm like, man, I've never had stuff like that before. And you know, I cracked a book and started looking at it going, oh, I'm killing the microbiome that are my defensive barrier that live and coexist with me on my hands. So it's not about you know, killing all the bacteria, which is how we've we've really framed our minds. It's like you know, we, we do airstrikes on everything in our culture, right? <laughs> it, it's it's about having the good guys, you know, and that's kind of been a theme with our show is is really cultivating a relationship with that, and that also happens on the skin. Yeah, it does. And in the case of babies, three, there's they have three times more skin for their body weight than an adult. So that absorption that we know about and all those tests we run and the fact that we can see sunscreen chemicals show up in the urine and blood samples of people after they've been using harsh chemicals on the skin, all those factors are amplified by at least three for babies. Mm, this is really interesting. So, you know, one of the places I go, I don't know the literature on babies as well, Kim, but I, I think about that study that was published in the Daily Mail that showed that the average woman slathers 515 synthetic chemicals on her body every day. 
which yeah. is just so stunning. And so I, I really appreciate this uh, advocacy and this work that you do in this particular realm. But teach me more about babies. I mean, just like that little fact about them having three times as much skin surface area for their weight compared to adults, you can just really start to see, oh my gosh, okay, this is can, this can either be a sacred opportunity or like a place where we get it totally wrong. Yeah, yeah, well said, well said. So baby skin is very different from adult skin in many, many ways. Um, first of all, <clears throat> going all the way back to gestation, skin is one of the last organs to develop. So in those last few weeks of gestation is when the majority of thickening and functionality happens for baby skin. So babies that are born prematurely or babies that are on scheduled C-sections because they're always a week or two early because they don't want to, the doctors don't want to risk the woman going into labor, those babies are even more at risk than full-term babies. So this is one of my, one of my advocacy points, which is about skin, even though it may not seem like it, is to really try to keep those babies in there and cook them for as long as possible because it benefits the skin. So whenever it is possible, to not schedule a C is a great idea. Um, so some of those factors are that baby skin at birth is about five times thinner than adult skin, so it's, it's way more absorptive. And babies are born almost sterile. They, inside the amniotic fluid, inside the human body, it's a sterile environment. So when they come out, they don't have any of that healthy microflora that Pedram was just speaking about. So within the first 48 hours of birth is actually when most of that occurs. And if you think about our healthcare system, too often a baby is born, taken away from mom, and put in an incubator or in a, in a, a holder, a cradle of some kind. And if you think about what that has been cleaned with, it's something along the lines of a Purell that has managed to sterilize everything except the most harmful pathogenic bacteria. <laughs> so in our culture, we're in an environment where we're taking this precious new life with this fragile, new, sterile, thin, permeable skin and taking them out of where they should be and where they should be in every, in every case where it's possible. Sometimes it's not possible. But where it's possible into mom's chest to be held so that that first injection, so to speak, of healthy microflora can be passed from mom to baby. And some of the things that mom can do to help prepare for that are use probiotic products and, and help maintain her own microflora before baby's even born so that she's making sure that it is the healthiest environment to pop into. So some of the other factors specifically to your question are that the sebaceous glands, the oil-producing glands, are underactive. It takes up to a year for those to become fully active. So you have a skin that's highly permeable, so easily dehydrated. Water will flow out of it easily that doesn't necessarily have the proper oil barrier because those sebaceous glands are under, under, underproducing. So the oil is part of what keeps the moisture in. So not enough oil. And then in the case of sun and UVA and B exposure, 95% of exposure that, that's coming to the earth is actually UVA, which we can't necessarily see, but it penetrates the skin cells, it damages DNA, causes all kinds of problems, premature aging, potentially cancer, all these factors. The baby skin doesn't have, their, their melanocytes aren't producing enough melanin yet, so it doesn't have its natural sun protective factors. Those are some of the key pieces, and I guess the final piece would be the pH of baby skin. So our pH balance of skin should be about 5.5. Again, that baby's transitioning out of the amniotic fluid, which is closer to 7. So they have a, a time period, which could be a couple weeks or, or up to a year, and it's then something constant throughout our lives, even as adults, where we want to support a healthy pH balance, protect the acid mantle barrier on baby skin. I'm so happy to have you on the show because this is stuff that we don't hear that often. And I've been in healthcare for a long yeah. time, right? Yeah. And this is, this is, I mean, for me, I mean, we, we were talking about this, uh, you know, when you were, uh, she actually visited our house. Our, our son, Soul, came two weeks early and Kim's like, I'm coming over. And, you know, she sat, she sat with Elmira and sat with the baby and really kind of did what needed to be done for kind of establishing that skin to skin time so that he does get what he needs and, and gets that, that super inoculation and all that. And so, First of all, thank you for that. That was awesome. Um, 
And secondly, like, you know, this is, this is a big deal because what we're talking about now is almost like prenatal medicine and early preventative yeah. medicine and giving us uh, an opportunity to give these kids a fighting chance in a world filled with chemicals and, and toxic sludge and, and, you know, pathology that we're so kind of back on our heels on in the hospital system. It's like, it's kind of like how we dealt with the crack cocaine issue in the 80s, right? We kept trying to reform all these people that were addicts and then basically they said, well, why don't we go uh, do a huge education piece and, and prevent kids from going there and it was immensely successful right it was immensely successful so prenatal medicine to me is just I mean I think that's the future is, is really learning how to intercept disease at that stage where you know we're, we're embedding the soil of the skin with the healthy stuff you know I get chills every time I listen to you it is so incredibly wonderful to have people like you guys out there advocating and helping to share some of these messages and creating some of these messages. It is a time of creation in our space. People are not focusing on these things. You are literally the only person I've ever heard pay enough attention to prenatal care and how that affects not just the mom and the baby from nutritional perspective, but also all these other factors like skin that people just aren't considering. I, I can't thank you enough. No, well, thank you. Yeah, Kim, he gives me chills too. Sometimes I want to smack him, but sometimes he, <laughs> he still gives me chills. And I, so I want to go back to, and I, I also want to just say, I'm a board certified OBGYN and I've never learned about this stuff. I mean, this is not part of <clears throat> our curriculum. And so I'm really excited that we're bringing this to our listeners. I want to go back to the airstrikes because I, I really, you know, Pedram has a way with words, and I, I just feel like there's still so many airstrikes that we're not even aware of when it comes to our kid. You know, as you were talking about the skin of babies, I just was thinking, oh, geez, I didn't have any sauerkraut, like, throughout either of my pregnancies. I've got a <laughs> nine-year-old and a 14-year-old, like, have I, like, completely ruined them? Like, what, what can I do? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, we are resilient and we're paying it forward, right? My journey started 11 years ago with mine and I didn't have this information. I started, I had to find it. I had to discover it and go get the research and put the pieces together. So don't feel bad and no one else should feel bad. It's, it's time we give more to the generations that are coming and, um, and play our role that way. Um, but the, so specifically the, the airstrike question, um, one of the most ubiquitous ways that we are unintentionally harming these kids, their skin, is, Pedro already said it, it's chlorinated water. Our water is chlorinated to make it safe to drink. And guess what? That is horrible for our skin. It's also horrible for our lungs as we inhale it. If you think about the heat in a shower and a bath, it's allowing some of that steam to come off. So we're bathing in it and we're breathing it. So one of the most simple, best things that people can do to protect their skin and, and many of their other organs and overall health is a dechlorinator so that the water they're bathing in doesn't have that chlorine. And then to keep in mind beyond that, that that water is approximately a pH of 7. So anything we can do to bring the pH back down after a shower or bath is very helpful. Hmm. Lotions that are pH balanced after a shower will help lock in the moisture in the skin and bring that pH back down to a healthy le level where the microflora can thrive instead of too high where they die out. I love that. And that's so easy. I mean, you, you, bathe, yeah. you, you, know, you get a dechlorinator and then when you bathe the baby, you slather on some stuff and you've hedged your bet in that, at least in that kind of main uh, yes. category there, huh? Yes, yes. And then another broad, broadly occurring thing that people aren't necessarily thinking about is the antibiotics. The antibiotics in the non-organic food they're consuming, the antibiotics in meat that they're consuming, and the antibiotics in everyday products like Purell. So all of these things are destructive to our microflora and all of them are opportunities to, to change and to shift and to move into a lifestyle that supports not only the skin but our whole body health. Pedro, I feel like maybe people are wondering if we've renamed the podcast the Microbiome Project <laughs> or the Microbiome Bridge. Like, yeah. we won't shut up about the microbiome, uh, and it's, it's this, so fascinating. This, this is so funny, because, like, as she's thinking it, I, I, this, is, this is why Sarah and I get along. I was literally about to make that comment, and she, and she <laughs> made it. <laughs> totally. <laughs> this is why she's my work wife. Yeah, I, I mean... Chills. This, I have chills. Just this, saying. I've got chills. Yeah, this, this is... I mean, think about it. I mean, if this keeps coming up, guys... 
it's obviously super important and it's obviously a big piece of where medicine is going, has needed to go and will really kind of establish itself in the future is renegotiating. Uh, we, you know, we talked about Louis Pasteur uh, with, with Summer Boxes a second ago, right? Is renegotiating our relationship with life. Right, and that is uh, inside our body, on our skin, and how about outside our body with our national parks and, and, and like our ability to, to preserve the nature around us. It's like, it's like medicine declared war on life with antibiotics, and now it's like, okay, just kidding, never mind, how do we coexist with all the life around us, and how do we do it in a way that's balanced, healthy, and helps us thrive and doesn't choke out you know, the microbiome or the trees? Beautiful stuff. So Kim, I what about you know? I want to go back to this point you made about um, I'm just thinking about the hot bath I take every single night in the chlorinated water and how I'm you know totally screwed there too. So what are some of these lotions and potions that I can be using? Like, what do you mean a pH balancer? The first thing I think of as a gynecologist is refresh that stuff that sort of changes the pH in your vagina, and I don't think that's what you have in mind. No, it's not. No. Mm -hmm. overall balance. There are things we can do like, you know, the foods that we eat, the diet is really one of the main ways to protect the pH level of the body. That's, that's key. And if we can do that and then not use soaps that are damaging, that's great too. So specifically to your question, creams, using products that, um, that are pH balanced for skin. There are some like, uh, like soaps, Castile soaps, that for whatever reason have become very, very popular to care for skin, but their pH is close to 9, usually bet between 8.8 .8 and 9. So these are actually harmful for skin. Great for dishes, great for clothes, great for floors, not great for skin. So developing a deeper understanding of, or a, a bigger awareness, maybe, better said, about the pH of those products, and the manufacturers will tell you. Uh, many of them will advertise what their pHs are and if they're pH balanced for skin. If they say pH neutral, they're closer to 7, so no, not good for skin. Um, something else to keep in mind is that oil type products, so things made with heavy butters and you know, coconut butters and shea, things like that, they tend to be less pH relevant because pH, you have to have water for to be able to measure that factor. So making sure to avoid things like um, trying to avoid brand names, petroleum, petroleum byproducts, mineral oils and petrolatum, paraffin wax, uh, and straight petroleum. Those are ingredients that, while they are inert medically, right, they're not helping the skin. They're, they're snuffing out the microbiota. Um, they are not providing any form of nutrients to help the cell structures build and, um, and, and pass through, you know, to, to shuff, excuse me, to slough off. And, uh, and have those new cells come out. So using products that are natural, as organic as possible, uh, those are all important factors. And just for when you get out of a bath, to use a more oil-based product is a good idea. And then if you're using moisturizers, like Pedram was with his Purell fingers, and you're not necessarily coming out of a water environment, like a, like a bath, um, to use a water-based product first and then seal in that moisture with something that's an oil base. One of the biggest mistakes people make when they're trying to care for dry skin is they get all of these heavy, goopy, oily, non-aqueous products and put them on and expect their skin to heal, but they're not, there's no moisture to lock in. The skin's dry. So we need to replenish the moisture and then insulate that moisture with oil-based products. Wow. Very, very cool. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to do like a spritz of some flu, some water based thing. And then I'm putting some oil on. I, yes. I think I've got, I've got that thing down. Yes. So, um, Pedram, where, what else can we mine from Kim today? Because I, I feel like you know her a little bit better. And I, I just, there's, I feel like we barely tapped the, uh, the genius here. What yeah. else can we talk about? <laughs> well, yeah, I think, you know, it's, you know, the whole kind of metaphor of when you're in the airplane and the, you know, the, the, the trouble thing happens and the air masks, the, the, the oxygen masks come down, put her on yourself and then put her on your child type of thing. So I think, you know, people are always self-referential in, in like dealing with their problems. And a lot of times when I talk to parents about this, they're like, you know, there's this, this guilt, like, oh my God, what have I done? Have I ruined my child? Like, you know, you had a moment there where you, you kind of disclose that it's like, oh, oh crap, I didn't do any of that. Right. So maybe we can just kind of create a model so it's like okay mom and dad do this 
And then if you have a small child, do this and, and just kind of like, let's start to establish a little bit of a protocol so people walk away kind of understanding the first couple steps to do here. And then maybe we can just talk about the things that are just absolutely toxic for the skin uh, to be avoided at all costs because, you know, chlorine is one of them, but, uh, you know... There is so much crap that people are slathering on, and you know the the, the statistic we talk about: uh, the average woman in her life ingests ten pounds of lipstick, right? And so, you know, one of the things I do is uh, pull out their lipstick. I literally say, "Pull out your lipstick from your purse," and I say, "Okay, let's read these ingredients together, and let's see if we can pronounce them." So, do you want to eat ten pounds of this, right? And so, ingesting by eating is not that much different than ingesting by putting on your skin. So let's let's kind of let's let's circle around that because people need to know what to avoid and they need to know what to do in a practical sense because we're just not trying to scare them. Yep, yep, love it. Love it. That was about four things by the way. So I'm trying to take notes to make sure I, I hit the <laughs> yeah. crazy genius of your That mind. was my thought too. A four part <laughs> question. Thank you very yep. much, Pedro. <laughs> See, this is, this, is, I, this is why I love having okay, Sarah is because she just takes notes and then like keeps me on, on point. <laughs> yeah, I'm on like two pages now. <laughs> well, I like, let's start with where you started, which is modeling. Um, what we do as adults we have a pretty clear understanding, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test you. I wouldn't expect you to get all six of these like a professional skincare person would, but when you think about your skincare or when you go to an esthetician or um, a dermatologist, there's a routine. There's a, there's a process of skincare, particular facial care that you follow. What are the steps? Just visualize it. Let's see. Most people, you know, they, they'll get most of the six. What are the steps you go through? to care for your skin. I'm going to defer to Sarah because up to about two Whoa. years ago, I was, I was washing my face with a bar of soap until my wife caught me and said, what are you doing, you idiot? Right, so, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be a dumb guy actually, here. I was excited that Pedram was gonna walk us through his last facial. So I, I'm a little disappointed that he's deferring. But well, um, we'll start you off with, with cleanse your face. Yeah, so cleanse. okay, so cleanse and um, are we talking about going for a facial, like yeah. where, where they steam and so no, they... No, no, no. At home okay. care. Your, your, oh, home what, care. Your, what your routine should be. What most oh. skincare product lines say. And if you want me to just to go, I will. But I'm, I'm curious because most... I, I'm very confident that you'll get at least four of the six steps. Yeah, I don't know about that. Maybe three. Okay, so cleanse mm -hmm. and uh, depending on how advanced... I am that day. I may actually exfoliate, mm -hmm. and then I, I spray with this this water based toner that smells yeah. like angels are kissing me, <laughs> <laughs> and then I put on like this oil serum. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. So the oil serum is probably for some maybe fine lines or not that you have any, but something that you maybe if you've got any hyperpigmentation, things like that, there are generally serums is the fifth step and then moisturizers. A lot of times after somebody does a spot treat, they'll put on an overall moisturizer and then sun care if they're out in the sun. Yes. Sun care. Okay. Got it. Yes. So my point here is that you know what to do. You know how to take care of yourself. But do we know how to take care of baby skin? No, mm. nobody tells us. And so we've, we've refined it down to three basic steps. Cleanse, nourish, and defend. Cleanse with a pH balanced cleanser that rinses off completely and quickly. Nourish with products that will provide the building blocks and the protection that that skin doesn't necessarily have. And then defend. That third step, defend, helps us with all the basic skin conditions that babies face. They, and they face a lot. Eczema, for example, I think it's about 30% of babies that are experiencing eczema now. We've got excessive UVA rays coming through, chlorinated water, air pollution. About 60-70% of what goes on the skin surface is abs absorbed very quickly into the bloodstream, which is causing eczema, rashes, all kinds of unexplained havoc for the skin. So eczema, baby acne, sunburns, bugs. So there are these things that we can protect baby skin from. And that's the defend step is think about what it needs. How do we keep the skin functioning healthfully? If I just made up a word, I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> so that, a word. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> because Sarah says so. Um, so that it can continue its developmental process and continue protecting the body and continue acting for the immune system and for the overall health the way it was meant to. Mm. Okay, so I've got a follow-up question. <clears throat> yeah. 
And I, I, this relates to the fact that mosquitoes absolutely love me and love one of my daughters. Like we just get mauled every time we go on a fishing trip with my darling husband. Mm -hmm. So what do you, you know, I would say for that defend category, yeah. you know, my poor little one has, I think 17 mosquito bites on her, her adorable arms. And I just look at the toxic crap that's out there for trying to prevent mosquito bites. And it just, you know, fills me with sadness. Yeah. Any suggestions on defending against mosquitoes? Yeah, avoid DEET. Avoid DEET <laughs> is the number one. And most people know that, but it, it tends to be that, well, I don't know what else to do and I don't want bug bites. Uh, but the fact is that there are natural bug repellents that have 20% effectiveness, the equivalent of 20% DEET effectiveness. And your average family-based DEET bug repellent is about a 7% effectiveness. So this idea that you can use DEET and have it work better than non-DEET on a child or on somebody who's, who's chemically sensitive is actually just wrong. You can mm. use a naturally based bug repellent and if you don't have user error, you will be more protected than a DEET based product. DEET mm. has more marketing behind it, more advertising, more multinationals supporting its effectiveness. But the facts are at 7% or at that family safe level, it is not more effective. The trick with a natural bug repellent is to make sure that every area is covered. I prefer lotions to sprays because with the spray you don't necessarily know where you're going with it and a bunch of it goes out into the environment. Um, but if you use a lotion and truly cover yourself the same way you do when you're thinking about sunscreen, then it, it will work. Um, it's very simple, very straightforward. And then also frequency. You know, there's unfortunately, we can't get that same level of um, length, length of effectiveness, time of effectiveness with the natural. So you just keep reapplying. And if you don't want to use those heavy chemicals, that's the way to do it. I, gotcha. well, you know, that's, that's so cool to hear because I spend a lot of time in the back country and I just refuse to use DEET because I'd rather have bug bites than cancer type of thing. But <laughs> it's, it's one of those things where psychologically you feel like because this thing, uh, you, you know, has kind of, it has this meme, right, that it, it works and you yep. believe that it works better yeah. than the others, you're like, oh, wow, I still got, you know, bug bites. Thank God I was wearing that DEET. And, yes. and I, you, right? And I love <laughs> the fact that you just dispelled that for me because it's just like I had kind of put it there and, and that's how powerful marketing is right yeah. I just believed that it worked better but I was not I didn't want to make a deal with the devil and so you're right just take that I used to use uh, jungle juice from REI there's a few of these formulas that were you know or, uh, organic and they smelled okay and 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 they worked fine except I just wasn't applying them enough so thank you you just changed my life <laughs> you're <laughs> most welcome that you couldn't have possibly said anything better to me really thank you mm. <laughs> Okay, Thank are we you. ready for the sexy librarian moment? I think we are. I mean, we can Ooh. hang out with her all day. Uh, so <laughs> I guess we'll, we'll have you back at some point. But yeah, let's, let's get a recap from Sarah here. All right. So this is wisdom from Kim. Number one, everyone was treating the skin as a cellophane wrapper. You know, that's kind of our tendency. That's sort of the default as this, you know, when it happens to be the largest organ in our body, and it's also an incredibly absorptive organ, especially in babies. Number two, I had to throw in Pedram, this idea that we do airstrikes on everything in our lives and we need to like stop it right now. Number three, Kim, you got into great details about how baby's skin is different from adult skin. And I hope I captured all of them. Let me know if I didn't. It's the last system to develop. So premature babies, babies that are born, you know, significantly before their their due date, scheduled C-sections, for instance, those babies are at greater risk because their skin's even thinner. It's the organ system that is the last to develop, so it's not fully developed. You said it's five times thinner at birth than adult skin, so it's hyperpermeable. The sebaceous glands are underactive. They don't become fully active for a year. And also, our pH is 5.5, but babies that are transitioning, especially in those first few weeks, from the amniotic fluid, which has a pH of about seven, there is this transition period where their pH is shifting. Number four. Before we move on, I just want to take out the absolutes on that. The, it's not the last organ to develop. It's one of the last organs to develop. And it's not exactly five times thinner. It's approximately five times thinner, depending upon a few things. Um, and go ahead. 
<laughs> okay, a few caveats. It's okay. No. We, we're good with, you know, ballparks here. So then we got into some of the airstrikes. That was number four. And you talked about chlorinated water, how it's bad for your skin and your lungs. And so an easy thing to do is to get a dechlorinator. You also talked about how we need to, uh, you know, the pH goes up when you are exposed to chlorine after you are cleansing. And so we want to have a pH balancing treatment that we have after we get out of the bath. And uh, you made this point about staying away from antibiotics like Purell. Number five, you, uh, this was Pedram again, about renegotiating our covenant, our contract with life and the microbiome. Number six, you talked about establishing the protocol. I really like this, the modeling concept and how with babies, we want to focus on cleanse, nourish, defend. And then number seven, I wanted to go a little further with defend. And I asked you about mosquito bites and how to prevent those. And you did such a great job kind of dispelling that myth that we have that DEET is the only way to go. And you made this point that it's 7% effective. Whereas if you look at some of these safer, non-toxic ways of preventing bug bites like mosquito bites, they're 20% effective. So I really appreciate that. Again, <clears throat> approximately. Approximately. <laughs> cool. But that's, you know, uh, that rough math makes a, makes a world of difference because I think we all need to just kind of look at how we've been marketed to by the chemical industry and realize that, you know, A, it's not good for you and B, it's not as effective as they're saying it is. And so what are we doing, right? So Kim, you've got such, you've got such a, a vast array of things that you've been working on and developing and all this. And I just, I want you to be able to share that with our audience. Um, we actually, you know, full disclosure, she came over with a gift bag of, of stuff, products that she developed and we use it every day on our kid. And, um, you know, so far he's uh, thriving and healthy and happy and you know, doing everything. So uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of the stuff that you're, you're doing. So tell us how people can find you and, and, your, and your product line and all that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm Kim Walls, K-I-M-W-A-L-L-S, and uh, have all kinds of writing out there, which you can find at well.org and uh, Google. Uh, my company is called Epicential. Uh, that's E-P-I-S-E-N-C-I-A-L. And our brand is Baby Time. Baby time by Epicentral. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Well, we're big fans and I just, I love where you're coming from. You've got that like, that lovely like mama energy. You're doing this to protect your cubs. And I just, I think that's <laughs> one of the most powerful forces in the universe. And, you, uh, and yeah, Sarah, Sarah is one, Sarah's one of those too. So I'm just, I'm basking in your guys' sunshine. <laughs> Likewise to both of you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for all Kim. you're doing. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. You've really educated me so much and I hope our listeners feel that too. Cool, guys, and we'll put transcripts if you need notes on healthbridgeshow.com. So uh, we've got the notes for you. You don't need to go uh, hustle up and say, what did she say here or there? So just go to healthbridgeshow.com and we'll get the transcripts for you. Cool, thanks guys, see you next, next time. All right, bye everybody. Bye.